Farewell to Manzanar, Chapter 8 Inu With Papa back, our cubicle was filled to overflowing. Woody brought in another army bunk and tick mattress up next to Mama's. But that was not what crowded the room. It was Papa himself, his dark, bitter, brooding presence. Once moved in, it seemed he didn't go outside for months. He sat in there or paced alone a great deal of the time, and Mama had to bring his meals from the mess hall. He made her bring him extra portions of rice or cans of the syrupy fruit they served. He would save this up and concoct brews in a homemade still he kept behind the door. Brews that smelled so bad Mama was ashamed to let in any visitors. Day after day he would sip his rice wine or his apricot brandy, sip till he was blind drunk and passed out. In the morning he would wake up groaning like the demon in a kabuki drama. He would vomit and then start sipping again. He terrified all of us, lurching around the tiny room, cursing in Japanese and swinging his bottles wildly. No one could pacify him. Mama got nothing but threats and abuse for her attempts to comfort him. I turned eight that fall. I remember telling myself that he never went out and never associated with others because he thought he was better than they were and was angry at being forced to live so close to them for the first time in his life. I told myself they whispered about him because he brewed his own foul-smelling wine in our barracks. All of this was partly true, but there were deeper, uglier reasons for his isolation. I first sensed it one night when Mama and I went to the latrine together. By this time, the stalls were partitioned. Two Terminal Island women about Mama's age were leaving just as we walked in. They lingered by the doorway, and from inside my stall I could hear them whispering about Papa deliberately, just loud enough for us to hear. They kept using the word Inu. I knew it meant dog, and I thought at the time they were backbiting him because he never socialized. Spoken Japanese is full of disrespectful insult words that can be much more cutting than mere vulgarity. They have to do with bad manners or worse, breaches of faith and loyalty. Years later, I learned that Inu also meant collaborator or informer. Members of the Japanese American Citizens League were being called Inu for having helped the army arrange a peaceful and orderly evacuation. Men who cooperated with camp authorities in any way could be labeled Inu, as well as those genuine informers inside the camp who relayed information to the War Department and to the FBI. For the women in the late night latrine, Papa was an Inu because he had been released from Fort Lincoln earlier than most of the Issy men many of whom had to remain up there separated from their families throughout the war. After investigating his record, the Justice Department found no reason to detain him any longer. But the rumor was that, as an interpreter, he had access to information from fellow Issys that he later used to buy his release. This whispered charge, added to the shame of everything that had happened to him, was simply more than he could bear. He did not yet have the strength to resist it. He exiled himself like a leper, and he drank. The night Mama and I came back from the latrine with this newest bit of gossip, he had been drinking all day. At the first mention of what we'd overheard, he flew into a rage. He began to curse her for listening to such lies. Then he cursed her for leaving him alone and wanted to know where she had really gone. He cursed her for coming back and disturbing him, for not bringing his food on time, for bringing too much cabbage and not enough rice. He yelled and shook his fists and with his very threats forced her across the cluttered room until she collided with one of the steel bed frames and fell back onto a mattress. I had crawled under another bunk and huddled, too frightened to cry. In a house, I would have run to another room, but in the tight little world of our cubicle, there was no escaping this scene. I knew his wrath could turn on to any one of us. Keel was already in bed, scrunched down under the covers, hoping not to be seen. Mama began to weep, great silent tears, and Papa was now limping back and forth beside the bunk, like a caged animal, brandishing his long-polished North Dakota cane. I'm going to kill you this time. Go ahead if that will make you happy. You lie to me. You imprison me here with your lies. Kill me then. I don't care. I just don't care. I can never go outside because of you. Here. Here is my head, my chest. Get it over with. Who wants to go on living like this? She was lying very still, gazing up at him. The tears had stopped. Papa stood over her, gripping his cane in both hands, right above her head, holding it so tightly the cane on both his arms quivered. All right, he yelled. All right, I will, I will, I will. 
We had watched many scenes like this since his return, with Papa acting so crazy sometimes you could almost laugh at the samurai in him, trying to cow her with sheer noise and fierce display. But these were still unfamiliar visits from a demon we had never seen when we lived in Ocean Park. There had always been doors to keep some moments private. Here there were no doors, nothing was private, and tonight he was far too serious. He seemed to have reached some final limit. Inside my own helplessness, I cowered, sure he was going to kill her or hurt her very badly, and the way Mama lay there, I believe she was actually ready to be beaten to death. Keo must have felt something similar because at the height of Papa's tirade, he threw his covers back and in his underwear he jumped out of bed yelling, Stop it, Papa! Stop it! With his cane in both hands high above his head, Papa turned from the waist. Keo sprang across the room, one arm cocked, and punched Papa square in the face. No one had ever seen such a thing before. Papa's arms went limp. The cane fell clattering to the floor. He reached up and touched his nose. Blood was pouring onto his shirt, dripping down onto Mama's dress. Keo stepped back, crouching, staring at the blood. This was like bloodying the nose of God. His face, contorted, looked ready to cry, but even his tears were stopped by the knowledge of what he had done. He waited paralyzed for whatever punishment might strike him down. Papa couldn't move either. He stared at Keo, his eyes wide with both outrage and admiration that his son had the courage to do this. They stood like that until Papa's gaze went bleary from the drink in his veins and dropped to the damp shirt, to the blood still spattering onto Mama's dress. Keo turned and bolted out the door. I ran over to Mama, whimpering with relief that this ghastly scene was over and she had been saved, yet aching with a great sadness I could not at the time find words for. I was proud of Keo and afraid for what would happen to him, but deeper than that, I felt the miserable sense of loss that comes when the center has collapsed and everything seems to be flying apart around you. Keo had fled to one of my married sister's barracks. For two weeks, he hid there. When he finally returned, it was to admit that he had been in the wrong and ask Papa's forgiveness. He too wanted some order preserved in the world and in the family. Papa accepted his apology, and this settled the waters some. But that aching sadness did not go away. It was something undefinable I'd already been living with for months, now inflamed by Papa's downfall. He kept pursuing oblivion through drink. He kept abusing Mama, and there seemed to be no way out of it for anyone. You couldn't even run.